Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcast, where we're covering the latest stories, trends, and innovations with leaders in global connectivity, real estate, and the networks within. I'm Emily Scherer for JSA, and I am joined today by Stephen Sprockholt of Edge Connects. Um, he is the Vice President of Program Management for EMEA. Um, and Edge Connects, of course, a data center leader reimagining the future of hyperlocal to hyperscale data center services. Stephen, it's great to have you here this morning. Thanks yeah. for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, Emily, yeah, it's great to be in Oslo today, although it's a little bit rainy outside. Yesterday was a much more yeah. beautiful day with uh, great sunshine. That's so true. Yeah. And were you able to get out and enjoy it yesterday? Yeah. In the evening, we uh, to took a small stroll. And, oh, uh, good. Yeah, we did the same thing. So, yeah, and got dinner down by the water. It was really nice. Yeah, it, Oslo is Oslo is a great place to be. It is. It is. Great. And you're in Amsterdam. We were just talking about yeah, this. Okay. Yeah, I'm usually based in, uh, in Amsterdam, if not visiting one of our project sites. So. Excellent. I love that. So not far travel here for Stephen today. I'm um, having a great time in Oslo. Um, and Stephen, tell us a little bit about your role as Vice President of Program Management um, for EMEA on the Edge Connect sustainability team. Yeah, sure. So um, as a Vice President of projects uh, of Project Management for EMEA, um, I oversee our data center builds across uh, Europe. Right now we are building seven data centers. Uh, so yeah, that's... Uh, that's quite the uh, the pipeline that's going on. Um, but how does that relate to sustainability? Well, in my day-to-day -day work, I see what it means to build a data center, the amount, the sheer amount of materials, effort, labor, all that sort of stuff that goes into the build. And that also poses the question to me of like, how can we do better? How can we take better care uh, of our environment? And what can we implement to get the results that we want to become carbon neutral while also at the same time growing uh, our data center business? Because everybody's coming to us with, hey, could you build us a data center? Or, hey, we want to go there. Right, so there's right. a significant demand for, for this. Um, at the same time, another challenge that I'm really excited about in how can data centers help there is um, you see many congested electricity grids out there getting grid connections is more and more of a difficulty. So thinking about ways how, what sustainable solutions are out there that we can help resolve this, make me very excited to also be part of the uh, Edge Connect sustainability team. Absolutely. It sounds like you guys have so much going on. Seven data center builds. That's huge. And then worrying about the sustainability aspect. You are a busy man, I'm sure. Oh, I, I <laughs> no, no rest for the wicked. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, great. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, and in 2020, Edge Connects launched its customer people planet strategy by implementing its holistic ESG sustainability policy. Um, could you explain a little bit more about Edge Connects' path to sustainability and that carbon free energy policy? pilot plan yeah so one of the important key drivers of our sustainability is not only look about or look towards co2 emissions yes co2 emissions are very important but um, let's say we live in a world where there are no co2 emissions but people are still not making a fair wage or uh, there are still many accidents on job sites then I don't know if that's still the place I want to live in yes the weather outside is probably nice <laughs> But um, it's, it's not the world where we want to live in. So uh, our holistic view is to incorporate uh, uh, social elements as well in our sustainability policy. And more importantly, also to be transparent and accountable towards the results that we, that we publish. So if there's like uh, something that's not going all right, we will publish that and uh, we are accountable for those results. And that's more of the, the G of governance where we really uh, strive to improve our policy and um, yeah, achieve our 2030 goals. Absolutely. And we, we talked so much yesterday about greenwashing. So really that the important piece of transparency there in publishing those ESG reports. Yeah, transparency yeah, so. is, is just so important. And if you look at all the various sustainability uh, uh, reports that are out there, uh, I think one step as an industry that we can take is just make sure that we report all the same metric. Right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that might take a while, right? That might so. take a while. <laughs> uh, a lot of stuff but to be done on, on that level. But you also see is that this is slowly also with European regulation and many other things slowly moving towards a, a common standard. So that would be a great result to get that accountability and um, uh, 
it could come to be the transparency. Absolutely. Yeah. And so much of what's been talked about here today. So it's great to get everybody in the same room talking about what those metrics look like. Absolutely. Um, now, let's talk about um, the social component of ESG policies and engagement. How does Edge Connects work with local communities to become a good or better neighbor? So uh, what we do is, and I think one of the examples is with one of our data centers that we had in Amsterdam, um, it had a permit, everything was done, but the local residents had an issue with the noise coming from our data center. Um, and in that case, it is easy to say as a company, hey, I've got my permits. Hey, um, the municipality cannot enforce because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, we felt that that is not the proper way how, how to um, uh, deal with your neighbors because you're the one who is make, who's benefiting from the data center and they're left with all the negative externalities of noise, light, and that's uh, pollution. Yep. So we took their message to heart. Um, we started a project to see how can we um, reduce noise levels. Um, of course, the local residents wanted it to go faster. But there's also due diligence from our end that we need to do. We can't just simply put up a screen or just simply change settings because that can have unintended side effects to our operations. Right. Uh, but during the summer, we were able to um, reduce noise by about six to eight decibels, depending on the frequency. So that's an 80 percent reduction in, uh, in perceived noise. Um, and well, we need to see what the results, how the results come in over a year's time but likely we're able to reduce the mechanical energy uh, consumption by about 5%. Wow, that's so great. Big. Still, still, fingers crossed yeah, on fingers whether, crossed on whether after full years of operation we can <laughs> accurately, transparently, and accountably report on those numbers. Yeah. But um, that would be a great, uh, uh, great benefit um, to the local community. Um, and I think that is for an existing data center, but if you... What we have all experienced here is that data centers are not looked at as favorably as maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means that you need to get the support of the communities to build a data center because otherwise you're not going to get a permit. Yeah. And we have seen examples of those, I think, across Europe where companies were like, hey, I can build a data center here. And yeah, yes, you could. But then um, the local residents revolted and said like, no. Yeah, a little um, bit of pushback. So yeah. that means that you need to think about how do you share um, the benefits of that data center? How do you make those benefits tangible for those residents? Because simply saying jobs is not is not sufficient if you have a local artist living nearby because right. Right. there's just not, not that much of a perceived benefit. So yeah. uh, reaching out, uh, creating a park, creating mm -hmm. um, uh, a more interesting building that they can look at. Those are items where you can look at. Right how to uh, make sure that the community benefits. District heating could also be Absolutely. one of those items. And even as you said, just being a good neighbor about it and being listening. transparent, listening to them about listening, yeah, Listening what to their, their complaints because be. it's, yeah. let's say that you test your generators. If, if you test your generators every, every Monday morning at 6 a.m., yes, you could do that, but I'm yeah. sure a lot of people will wake up. Um, <laughs> not which, very happy. <laughs> not <Yeah>. very happy. <laughs> yeah. So if you say like, what we have done, Anywhere where we are, um, local residents have our operations team phone number. If for some yeah. reason they had a late shift or whatever, right. they can tell us, please don't. Yeah. And we can uh, adjust the, the testing schedule. It. Absolutely. And just being there, picking up the phone, mm -hmm. so important. Absolutely. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. The 80% noise reduction, huge. And yeah, fingers crossed on, yeah, the final number. So <laughs> that's great. Um, now let's talk trends a little bit. Through your experience, how do you see the industry evolving as sustainability shifts to the spotlight? What do you think will have the biggest impacts? I think what we have is two two trends at the same time. So one is more focused on sustainability. At the same time, what I referred to earlier is the tremendous growth of the industry. Right. We are, right now we are seeing the results from machine learning and automation of business processes mm -hmm. all going to the cloud, uh, requiring more data center space. And we're building those data centers today. At the same time, I'm sure that everyone has heard, or at least the listeners have heard of ChatGPT and AI. Yeah, of course. Which of course. will mean 
an even further growth in required data center capacity. Right. So that means that the materials that we need to build those data centers will exponentially increase, while at the same time we want to reduce our carbon emissions and, and footprint. So those are two tangents that are opposing, but I think as we are at a, a crossroads, um, I think the industry will come up with solutions and together, sometimes just small changes, continuous improvement, like we did at the, the site where we were reduced noise reduction and reduced uh, um, the energy uh, use of the cooling machines. And sometimes it will be more fundamental shifts. But I think those two will come together somewhere Absolutely. later this decade. And we'll see that uh, uh, the data centers of 10 years ago are vastly different than the data centers that we right. will build in 2030. Absolutely. And but that doesn't up, mean that we need to wait until 2030. We should get started We now need to even. start improving every right. iteration. And even the incremental change, like you said, and just, yeah, there's so much that can be done. I feel like conferences like this, Data Cloud ESG, important conversations happening, people coming together to figure um, out what those changes need to be. So Yeah, I mean, there are manufacturers sharing. here, uh, still have a yeah. couple of meetings planned here uh, yeah. with those to talk about, hey, how can we together collaborate in yes. improving the existing machines? And also, what do you need from us to design this new uh, silver bullet machine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, no great. energy use, fantastic cooling. That we yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's hopefully that's where we'll be by 2030, right? That's where we're headed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think one thing that, uh, one part of a question that we missed earlier on was the carbon free, uh, pilot plan that we have. I think that is also an important driver, uh, based on accountability and transparency that we mentioned before. Yes. Um, what you see now is that companies report zero uh, kilowatt hour uh, emissions mm -hmm. because their facility is connected to a solar park or they yeah. have a solar PPA. Unfortunately, solar PPAs don't work necessarily in the northern hemisphere's winters because there's not much sunshine. Yeah. Um, but you can offset those. You can act like the solar facility, according to the greenhouse protocol, uh, produced power throughout the year. Um, our carbon, f um, carbon free energy pilot program is trying to meet on an hour by hour basis our consumption with renewable energy sources. Those can be hydro, uh, sun or solar and, and wind. Right. And that means that at any time during the day, there's a renewable energy source providing us with electricity. So we can truly say then that we had zero fossil fuel powering us through the winter. Um, there are still challenges because we, we run two successful pilot programs. Challenges are still related to regulation. Can you do that according to current energy laws in all the various geographies around the world and sometimes within uh, a country itself? Yeah. But this will be a, a major step for the industry and also mm -hmm. a major driver to the flexibility that grid operators want to see Yes. Uh, on how are we going to power our data centers through the winter or power our data centers through that misty, cloudy, wind still. Right, right. What do we do day. when there's no sun out? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for being here. It's been great to have you um, and hear all of these insights. So we thank you for joining us yeah, today. Yeah, no problem. Absolutely. And to our viewers, we remind you to stay curious, stay connected, and happy networking.